glad you've been here today. It's not the easiest place to reach, but it's nice. Yeah. Uh, I just started with a brief introduction. A minimalist, a minimalist introduction to Mond, or a definition of Mond, I should say. Mond, of course, is an algorithm. I mean, this is the simplest definition you can give. It's an algorithm that permits actually the distribution of force in an object from the observable distribution of baryonic matter with only one additional fixed universal parameter with units of acceleration. That's it. And it works. It works at least very well for galaxies. And this is problematic for dark matter because that's not something that, let's say, dark matter as it's perceived to be can naturally do. It's hard to imagine how you know, a dark halo could respond so sensitively to the actual observed distribution of matter. Uh, and the algorithm, of course, which is due to Milgram in 1983, seminal papers, important papers in 1983, uh, explains the systematic aspects, explains systematic aspects of galaxy photometry and kinematics, and it makes predictions. It makes predict predictions which CDM, standard dark matter paradigm, gets wrong. It's very simple. Uh, this is the this is the algorithm. The Newtonian acceleration, g, or let's say the observed acceleration, g times some function of the observed acceleration and units of the acceleration parameter is equal to the uh, Newtonian acceleration. Now uh, the, the function is not specified, but it must have this kind of asymptotic behavior. When acceleration is much larger in terms of the acceleration constant then mu of x is equal to 1. So g is equal to gn. That is, the, the, the acceleration is a Newtonian, Newtonian acceleration. Uh, and the, uh, in the other limit, where x is both much smaller, then mu of x is equal to x. Mu is equal to the acceleration over a naught in units of the, uh, the acceleration constant. Uh, so that's it. It's really very, very simple. Um, Um, now, everybody, at least everybody here who believes Mon, had a kind of a... started producing, thanks mostly to Kirtan Nevada and Renzo Sanjisi and their students, they started to be producing very high extended rotation curves uh, of spiral galaxies. And um, these are two students, Beth Rules and Begum, of, um, of Sanjisi and Kirtan Nevada. And the first one is a low surface brightness galaxy, which is, uh, that is to say, it's low in terms of the acceleration. This is ex acceleration and gamma, uh, sigma c is the acceleration expressed in terms of the, of the surface brightness. That, that is, it's, uh, let's say, a naught over g. Uh, so when the acceleration is below that limit, then you get, uh, you might say, in traditional say, sense, you would say dark matter dominated systems. That is, the discrepancy between the observed mass and the, uh, and the rotation curve. The, the, the rotation curve deduced from the observed mass and the observed rotation curve is very large. And here the uh, dash care curve is a, a rotation curve resulting from the stars alone in this galaxy. And the dotted curve is the, no, no, sorry, the dash curve is, is a rotation curve resulting from the gas in the galaxy. It's a very gassy galaxy. And the dotted curve is the rotation curve re resulting from the stars, strictly by Newtonian. And when you apply uh, Modi's little formula, you convert to, from the observed to the, to the, from the uh, uh, calculated, from the mass distribution to the observed. 
and it, it's fantastic. I mean, it, it, it lines right up. I mean, this this astounded me when I saw it. So there's got to be something to this idea. Because it has to be. You can't do this with dark matter. Uh, and there's something else. There's much else, actually. Uh, there is, of course, the Pelly Fisher relationship. Because when you take the simple mod, mod formula and you convert it right in, in terms of acceleration, centripetal acceleration, in terms of the mod force, you get this formula. This formula v to the fourth is g mass bearing on times a naught acceleration parameter. Very simple formula, and it works fantastically well. Now, now, uh, McGow, Stacy, had the brilliant idea of expressing this as a baryonic Pelly-Fisher relationship, which is very appropriate because it's more than just a name. You're saying, I mean, the standard model of dark you know, of galaxies is that you have a, uh, a little bit of baryonic, trace amount of baryonic, baryonic matter, and there's a very extensive halo that goes well beyond. And somehow, this little bit of baryonic mass down in the middle is determining, determining the rotation velocity of this vast extended halo. How does that work, possibly, with dark matter? How does it work? Nobody in the dark matter community has successfully answered that question. So you could just, I'll just summarize the successes of all. It predicts the form of galaxy rotation curves from the observable mass distribution. Now we know it's best to use the near infrared parameter uh, photometry, which is available, like satellites on Spitzer satellite. And uh, there are no fixed parameters. There's only one universal fixed parameter, a dog. And it works. I mean, it's incredible. The baryonic uh, Pelly Fisher relationship, for, you have the baryonic Pelly Fisher relationship for spirals, and the Faber Jackson relationship for ellipticals. They're explained, they're subsumed by this idea. And this presence of a preferred surface density in spirals, Friedman law, Friedman law, and the, um, the existence of a large discrepancy between the observed and the, and the, uh, uh, and the dynamical mass, a large discrepancy in low surface brightness galaxies, and a small discrepancy in high surface brightness galaxies. Explain. And there's the now the new radial acceleration relationship, Miguel, Dali, and others. Uh, and this relationship is totally subsumed by mod. It's evident. Uh, it's explained. It's explained before it was observed, actually, before the observations were pointed out. And all with one value fixed at value of a naught, which is on the order of c times the Hubble parameter. Uh, apparently, some cosmological significance. But the question that we, many of us have been wrestling with for many years is that is it underpinned? by new physics. Hmm. Well, I'll just show you. This is a photo of the, of the Mon workers in a community <laughs> in about, about 25 years ago. Uh, this is at a gathering, at a gathering similar to this in, in Groningen. And uh, yeah, this was it. I mean, <laughs> so the community has certainly grown looking around. And you see that there's Modi in the middle, uh, Modi Milgram in the middle, and I'm on the, his right side, and on his left side is Jacob Begenstein, who made major contributions to this field. Now, I'm going to talk mostly about Jacob. Jacob did his PhD in Princeton with John Wheeler, and he did, in his thesis work, he did fundamental work on black holes. He proposed the black holes possess the thermodynamic property of interbase, which is proportional to the surface area. And this had uh, major consequences. It led to the proposal by Hawking of, that for black holes radiate, and they slow, slowly evaporate as they radiate. And it also led to, or was very important, the promoting the holographic, holographic principle in physics. That is to say that uh, information is stored on the surface rather in one of n minus one dimensions rather than volume of n dimensions. <coughs> Very important to, uh, to uh, theoretical physics, string theory. Um, now, uh, what I'm going to discuss here are the Beckenstein's, Beckenstein's contribution to theoretical <coughs> to the theoretical basis of Milgromian dynamics. Now, uh, I, uh, I was at Princeton too, and my last year there corresponded to Jacob's first year. And I never met him, but I was aware of him because they had an office I 
housemate, actually, Terry Sanowski, who uh, was on the phone every night. I mean, in those days, there was only one phone in one house. <laughs> People didn't have their own personal phones. It's only one phone. And every night, all night long, Terry would be talking to somebody. And they would be talking like words like black holes, thermodynamics, and entropy, temperature, and, and kept me away. <laughs> I came to uh, Terry one morning and I said, what is this? What are you talking about? Who are you talking to? He said, why are you not talking to this young guy, uh, Jacob Beckinson, who um, uh, is really a smart guy. In fact, you're going to hear a lot more about him in the future. I did. Also, I must say that Terry became famous himself because he, he, um, uh, he took John McCall's John McCall advice, Jacob, and he got out of relativity. Uh, but he, um, he, went, he started the field, he went to Harvard and started the field, so he, he went to major in, in, in medicine in Harvard, in neurology, and he started a whole new field called computational, uh, uh, neurophysics, computational uh, neuroscience. And uh, he's, you know, been fantastically successful with this. But uh, that's another story. So, Now, what I'm going to describe mostly are the steps to Jacob's, uh, the, or I should say the first, really um, consistent relativ relativistic theory of Mollon, that is tensor vector scalar theory. <coughs> now, there are many reasons why you need a relativ relativistic theory of Mollon. What is it? You can do all, all of these problems. <coughs> Gravitational lensing, which is a, relativist, a relativistic effect, cosmology, involves relativity, structure formation, cosmic microwave background, <coughs> gravitational waves, that all becomes possible if you have a relativistic theory about dynamics. Now, this theory is primarily a phenomenologically driven theory. There are three fields, three free, free parameters, and one free function. It's bottom-up theory in the sense that attributes are added in response to particular pathologies are phenomenological requirements. It's not a theory where you write down grand principles and do modified dynamics, although I think Jacob would have liked such a theory. Now, it began in a seminal paper with uh, Benstein and Milgram uh, of Mond as a modification of gravity, uh, where they wrote down the famous a quadratic Lagrangian that is to say that action in the scalar field action is given by this formula. Uh, the, uh, the unusual thing is this coupling uh, the field, the matter, or the coupling of the field, or the field. It, and it's uh, not the usual scalar tensor, uh, let's say scalar field invariant. It is the, the invariant squared over a naught in units of a naught squared. It's a function of that, a general function. And when you go to the exercise and uh, you know take the the, uh, uh, the usual thing to derive a field equation, you get this 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 uh, aqua blue field equation, which is, as I say, quite famous, but it's quite nonlinear, as you can see. Uh, particularly since this function mu, which is the mod interpolating function, is actually the derivative of this function that appears in Lagrangian f. And uh, it's equal to 1 when x is greater than 1, and 1x to 1 half when x is less than 1. So it has this, this uh, has to have this asymptotic uh, that, uh, characteristic of the mod field, of the mod, little mod equation I wrote down to start with. Now it's a modified Poisson equation, and because of its, uh, it's derived from the Lagrangian, it's conservative. That is to say, the Lagrangian is invariant to space-time translations and rotations. So that means that the theory conserves linear momentum and energy and angular momentum. So it's, it's on a better physical basis, a more solid physical basis than you might say it was the original Mond equation. <laughs> now the, the little thing, out, the simple formula I wrote down before. Now, uh, um, the theory in the Mond limit conformally invariant, actually, which is a conformal transformation with an angle preserving space-time dependent scale transformation, which is kind of a nice property 
for a period and a half. And in the, in the an appendix to this paper, they actually um, made a relativistic version of this theory. They wrote down a covariant extension <coughs> to a quadratic field, a quadratic Lagrangian equation, which consisted of two fields. There was a scalar field Lagrangian, which was like the, the usual scalar field Lagrangian in terms of the state scalar gradient, but with a general function. That general function plays the role of the function you saw in the, in the non-relativistic version. And there's an interaction Lagrangian, which says that the, uh, the scalar field doesn't couple directly to matter, because then you get into troubles with the weak equivalence problem, weak equivalence uh, 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 requirement. Uh, it interacts jointly with the Einstein metric matter. So in this form, there's some function of the scalar field times the, um, the Einstein metric. So it, it multiplies the Einstein metric, and you end up with a metric theory as you need, as you need to. And you get, again, the usual field equation, and you get the uh, complete theory, which includes the uh, uh, G mu nu, that is the Einstein action, Hilbert Einstein action of general relativity. So it's a two-field theory. For the first time, you now we've introduced a two-field theory. Now, as before, the interpolation formula between the Mon, the Mon regime and the uh, Newtonian regime is given by the derivative of this general function of the scalar field invariant. And uh, the phenomenolo phenomenology requires that this function have a 50 to form. It goes as x to the 3 halves, the invariant to the 3 halves, when x is small, when the acceleration constant is less than a naught. And it goes as some said number of, say, omega uh, times x when x is large. Now, this is a non standard scalar tin uh, tensor theory. In a sense, you can look at it as a Franz Dickey here, famous Franz Dickey, uh, who introduced the idea of scalar fields as a com component of gravity. But uh, the local effects of relativity have to be small within the solar system. So that means omega has to be large. The uh, experimental uh, constraints on omega are, at least they were, omega has to be greater than 10 to the 4 to avoid uh, consequences, unobserved consequences solar system. Now, uh, you know, this formula aqua is not unfamiliar. It's kind of a, uh, an aspect of K, what's called K inflation, kinetic inflation, kinetic es essence, kinetically driven uh, uh, expansion of the universe, not driven, not, not driven by potential, by, by, but by driven by the kinetic, by the, uh, uh, kinetic term in the Lagrangian, the action. Now, the problem is that when you work it out, you find that the velocity of scalar waves is the square root of 2 times c, parallel to the direction of, of, the, of the scalar field gradient. That is, that scalar waves in this theory propagate faster than the speed of light. Now, for Jacob Bekenstein, this was a no-go, because he, um, you know, he was a classical relativist, and he didn't like things that went faster than I mean, now there's a little more open-minded to this, but he didn't like it, and he was put, he he wound up trying to change the theory. An immediate, but a more immediate problem actually was not a causal propagation of scalar waves; it was lensing, and that was a serious problem. And let me just go over briefly what constraints, what they what the constraints on the gravity theory are. There are very strong limits on the violation of the weak equivalent principle. That is. Uh, universality of free fall, the fact that a falling object in motion is independent of its composition, or its, or its structure, or its size. And uh, so that means particles relatively, relative, relativistic and non-relativistic -relativi should follow geodesics of the physical metric. The motion is independent of the composition or the internal structure. So there should be a, a physical metric, which we call the tau squiggle. G, G, U, U, U squiggle, a, a physical metric, which is not necessarily the same thing as the metric given by the Einstein equations. So there's a, uh, uh, I mean, in general relativity, it is. I mean, in general relativity, the physical metric is 
the uh, Einstein metric is a gravitational metric. So that's one thing that makes general relativity so simple, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Now, gravitational waves, of course, follow null geodesics of the gravitational metric. And electromagnetic waves all the knowledge of the ge geodesics of the physical metric. In general relativity, these are identical. So the, the velocity of gravitational waves is equal to the velocity of light, the velocity of the electromagnetic radiation. But what about modified theories of gravity? Well, the simplest modification is, as we've done, add a scalar field. <laughs> but then the weak equivalence uh, principle requires that we maintain a metric theory. So the, 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 the scalar field, phi, cannot couple directly to particles, but jointly to the Einstein metric, uh, with the Einstein metric to particles. So there's effectively a physical metric that becomes g, g mu squiggle, becomes equal to this function of the scalar field times the uh, Einstein metric. Now, one interesting thing about this formula is that although, although general, the metric, uh, the, the, the geodesics of the, of the geometry might coincide in general, and they certainly do not for null geodesics. That is, d tau squiggle equal to zero says g, g mu mu is equal to zero. So the, the metrics, uh, the, the geodesics of the physical metric coincide with the geodesics of the gravitational metric, the Einstein metric. So again, in fact, we do have g mu mu equal, we do have the speed of, of gravitational waves equal to the speed of light, that's fine. But it also means that, that electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves do not feel the scalar field. They're not affected. But not, uh, I'm sorry, they are affected. Uh, uh, they're not affected. Non-relativistic uh, particles are, not, are, are affected by the field. So, so the, this, this new field acts on slow-moving particles. It doesn't act on relativistic particles because of coincidence of the of the, uh, of the uh, uh, null geodesics. The point is that if you want a, a scalar field in addition, as an additional component of gravity, of the gravitational field, then with the usual conformal coupling, it affects the motion of slow-moving particles, but not relativistic particles. Gravitational, gravitational lensing only sees the baryonic matter, putting it this way, in the old-fashioned way, it only sees the baryonic matter, it doesn't see the dark matter. And that's an absolute contradiction with observations of lenses like clusters of galaxies in those days, but now certainly individual galaxies. That is, the, uh, the clusters or our individual galaxies are definitely seeing the dark matter. They're seeing whatever additional field is there. And that doesn't happen with the conformal translation, uh, the, uh, the conformal translation, uh, transformation of the gravitational physical. So the solution is, a solution is, a disformal transformation. That is, you pick out, you know, uh, a uh, uh, conformal transformation takes the geometry defined by a given that metric, and it expands it or contracts it in an isotropic way. Space dependent, space time dependent, but isotropic way. So all dimensions expand, contract by the same amount. Uh, and, uh, um, and so, if you want to, if you want to, uh, this formal transformation, you have to pick out one particular direction and expand it by a different factor, and that was called a this formal transformation. So, since you would like space in general to be isotropic, that means you should pick out the time direction for this additional exp expansion or contraction. Uh, now, of course, this this. Uh, uh, one way of doing this is to make the transformation not as a, in the simple form that I wrote down before, as a simple factor of the, of the scalar field multiplying the metric, the Einstein metric, but by this more complicated, complicated uh, 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 construction where you add a, a, a vector field, a vector field which picks out a particular direction. And with, that, with this kind of transformation between the physical and the, uh, and the, and the geometric, between the physical and the uh, 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 gravitational metric, you can get the correct deflection, the deflection of light by gravitational masses. Now, as I say, this was called a, this formal transformation, and it was part of a stratified 
the so-called stratified theory by me, me or not. Uh, in 1972, who was a student of Kip Horn, actually? And Kip Horn in those days was trying to, con trying to construct non-general -rel non relativity theories of gravity. And this was a theory with only a scalar field. And it, 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 he <coughs> got the, the correct gravitational lensing by making this visceral transformation. And so you can do the same thing with Mon. Uh, the stratified theory, by the way, with only a scalar field certainly didn't work because there were many local gravitational things that should only be claimed by general relativity. But um, so you needed to, if you combine those, this, this with general relativity, uh, you combine this, uh, this formally uh, uh, transfer, trans, uh, conform, sorry, if, you, if you use this, this formal transformation uh, in a theory of a scalar tensor theory combined with relativity, you, got, you can get the right lensing as in general relativity. And that was my contribution because I, I wrote down this in 1997. <laughs> but the problem is that a non that, oh, yeah, by the way, I, I didn't. I didn't do that dynamics of the, of the, of the, of the tensor. I, I just postulated that as an absolute field in space, and that's contrary, totally contrary to the spirit of general relativity and the, the uh, concept of general covariance. And also, you can show that there's no conserved angular momentum tensor if you do that. But the cure, of course, then is to make the dynamical field, make the, the, the vector field dynamical. And that was what Jacob did in 2004. And that led to the complete theory of Tevis, tensor vector, scalar theory. Now, it's a more complicated theory because there are three fields. There's the um, tensor field, the gravitational, the Einstein tensor, which must, must reduce the general number. <coughs> There's a vector, which, thanks to Jacob, is dynamical and it's necessary for lensing. And there's a scalar which provides a non, uh, with a non-standard Lagrangian, which provides, the, you might say, the Mondian force. Now it's messy. There are three new parameters and one free function. And actually, as uh, Modi showed later, there's not approach general relativity as the acceleration uh, constant goes to zero. And there are phenomenological problems because the, the vector, uh, the vector does not establish. Uh, or let's say the vector establishes a preferred frame, and the firm fix cannot be entirely naturally suppressed. But let's go on to its successes. Let's see. The successes, oops, this is out of place. Uh, I mean, you might say there's a, there's a problem when you start constructing, <coughs> let, me, let me just do this first. Uh, uh, I missed a, on this, uh, the presentation, I don't have the entire theory written out, but it's complicated because there are three actions of three fields, the vector, tensor, scalar, and scalar. The scalar couples to, uh, to the physical metric, not the, not the gravitational metric, so scalar waves propagate at the speed of light, uh, which solves the problem that Jacob was so worried about. And uh, uh, the, um, the, the uh, vector field is, has a, action that's like that of um, electromagnetism, actually. But it doesn't, of course, couple to a charge uh, because you don't want to violate the, the uh, weak equivalence principle. So it introduce some additional parameter to couple to it. Uh, so uh, in a way, you could say it's a complicated machine to perform a simple task. I mean, the Mond equation is very simple. But the, this, this device that was constructed uh, is much more complicated. It's much more complicated than general relativity, which is only one field, you know, you might say that uh, G mu nu is a tensor field, and there's one in the coupling, in a sense, to, uh, to the uh, rest mass particles. So uh, it's a complicated thing. This, there, was a, there was a famous uh, uh, cartoonist and humorist in the 1940s, 1950s, who delighted in drawing complicated machines to, to solve simple problems, perform a simple task. Here, Rube Goldberg, who, who, uh, who had a device, this automatic music, music page turner, 
which you see is not too straightforward. There's, there's a lot of different steps. And in a way, uh, uh, tensor vector scalar vector theory is the same way. Uh, it's a complicated machine for basically a simple task. And I don't think, I think Jacob didn't like this aspect of it. He would like to have written down a few basic principles and derived mod from those basic principles, but that didn't turn out to be possible. Now, let me just sum up the successes of this theory, though. Mod phenomenology, phenomenology with enhanced gravitational uh, lensing was, uh, was, uh, was explained, and that's by construction, by this formally related physical metric and gravitational metric. The static post neutronium neutronium parameters were identical to general relativity. It's consistent with uh, deflection, precession, radar echo delay, delay. But um, the ether drift uh, uh, parameters, that is the parameters you get by mo moving with, with, with respect to the program, couldn't be entirely suppressed, and it required some fine tuning. Uh, and this was shown by Susan and Jacob uh, Sagi in 2012. The scalar waves are causal, causal and that's again because of construction, because of the, uh, the scalar field gradient couples directly to the physical metric not the gravitational metric. And the gravitational waves are also constant, causal, if, uh, if the scalar field is greater than zero, anyway, has value greater than zero. And that's because the velocity, pointing to this, uh, the velocity, uh, anyway. Well, the event was a spectacular event, uh, GW 170817 LIGO Virgo uh, uh, device detected the spectacular event. And it's an incredible example of multi messenger astronomy. That is, there was a, there was a, a gravitational wave event, which had a characteristic frequency given by this formula, C cubed over GN. And that was about 500 megahertz. Now, it's 500 hertz. Now, um, that comes down to the mass of about one solar mass. So this was something like a, a W, oh, my. something like a, uh, something like a neutron star, or, or mass, black hole, solar mass black hole, two solar mass black holes. And this was followed by a gamma ray, Fermi, a Fermi gamma ray burst, and it's a gamma ray burst in a Fermi satellite, uh, uh, short duration, and it was identified with a galaxy, uh, NGC 4993, at a distance of 40 megaparsecs. Now this had enormous implications. 
here. Gravity. Here's the event, I might say. Here is the, the, the top. Uh, the top is the, no, the bottom actually is the gravitational wave event. This is the frequency of the, of the event. And the, the frequency goes shooting up as the binary coalesces. <coughs> it spins around faster and faster. So that enables you to pinpoint the, the event precisely in time. And these are the, uh, the gamma ray results from the Fermi satellite at different frequencies. But you see that it follows the yeah, gravitational event by 1.7 seconds. Now, that's not, that shouldn't have been that. It shouldn't have been so small because you can calculate the, the Shapiro delay, Shapiro uh, delay of the gravitational waves. And, uh, how do I say, Shapiro of the, the Shapiro delay of the uh, gamma rays. <laughs> and uh, it should be 40, 445 days for obviously this mass. Uh, and uh, we observed is 1.7 seconds. So it's consistent with high accuracy with the uh, gravitational radiation being moving at the same rate as the electromagnetic radiation. And that falsifies, effectively <coughs> falsifies theories with this formally related metrics. So that would seem to rule out the EVES. Uh, say, Jacob would have been very interested in this result. Um, I might say there are alternatives. There, uh, there's an Einstein ether, an Einstein ether theory, which we'll hear more about in this meeting. It's a vector tensor theory with four invariants. And one vector field can be added. Uh, the vector field, four, four, four three parameter, new three parameters can be added. New, four new parameters. And Tevis was shown by Zlotzik and Al that Tevis can be written as an Einstein ether theory. If you, if you choose correctly the, uh, the invariance, these concepts. That is basically because you can eliminate the gravitational metric as a physical metric. And you can eliminate the gravitational metric and you're left only with the physical metric. So it's a one metric theory. Moreover, the, the energy density in the vector field can provide the effective dark matter lumps. And this can agree with the CMB and isopathy, major achievement by and close closely, and we'll hear more about that too, I suppose, in the community. I'll skip this. But I just say, in Jacob Beck's name, in retrospect, he was a classical relativist, and he would like to emulate like all classical relativists, he would like to emulate Einstein and enumerate grand principles and deduce mon. But the actual pro approach was bottom up. Elements were added in response to the uh, demands of time. This was unfortunate for Jacob, but he, he did the best with, what he, with the paradigm that he had. Uh, now, uh, Jacob had many personal qualities, of course. He was very self-confident, but he was modest. He was, he, uh, with me, I always found him uh, very patient and very understanding and uh, uh, not at all arrogant. But he was impatient with colleagues who he felt were out of their depth. That is, cosmology, cosmologists who wanted to do cosmology but knew little about the general relativity. He was particularly impatient with what he called the large scale you know, structure industry, which, which was a specialty in this institute, uh, where uh, people construct these models, in uh, numerical in body models, a large scale structure, with really a, not much understanding. And now, since I'm short of time, I'll try to now stop here. But I, in, in fact, let me just say that uh, I was very sad when, when Jacob passed away. And uh, I miss him, and I think the entire community of, uh, of relativists and astrophysicists and people interested in gravity, and new gravity theories, will, will miss him, are missing him.
describing this phenomenology, and yet here we are, 40 yeah. years are, <laughs> and we still have no idea what that might be. And I, I keep fantasizing that at some future time it will be obvious in retrospect, but Maybe we're so. not there yet. Maybe um, so. And that was apparently also the feeling that Jacob had, and yet that's not the approach that we ended up doing. Well, I, I like to use the example of uh, continental drift. Nobody doesn't like this much, but I like, I like to use the analogy of continental drift. And continental drift was proposed in about 1908, 1912 by Alfred Wegener, uh, a German uh, Austrian geophysicist, who, he, like many other people, he noticed that the, you know, South America, the, the, the west coast of South America fit together very, very nicely with the, with the east coast of I'm not saying it wrong. The West Coast, the East Coast of South America fit together very nicely with the uh, West Coast of Africa. And, uh, uh, but, but he thought there was more to it. And he saw that he did a, he looked at the fossil records and geological, geological records, and he saw that there was, a, there was a similarity in the rock formations, in the rock, rock compositions, and in the fossils on the East Coast of Africa, the West Coast of Africa, and the East Coast of South America. And he proposed that the continents had actually been stuck together and they, they drifted apart. Uh, and he was totally ridiculed at the time by the geophysical community because nobody, as they thought, this is incredible, this is crazy. What possible mechanism could cause the great continents to drift across the ocean floor? Uh, and Wegener, uh, you know, uh, still fought this battle, but he died in the 1930s on a cover expedition. Uh, and uh, it was not until about 19, I guess, the 1960s, when the concept of plate, plate, plate tectonics was discovered. And then it became very natural that these great plates of the continents lie on drift across the ocean floor. And they're not what they were. They're not in places where they were. And it became the paradigm uh, for the mechanism that structures the, the surface of the Earth. Uh, so, uh, in a way, it might be the same with Mond, because there is a, there's a fantastic theory that fits much of the data, but much of the community doesn't accept it. And partly, I mean, they're all kind of sociological and, uh, you say, political uh, matters, but partly it's because there's no, there's no really generally accepted mechanism that could cause this phenomenon. Uh, so it might be very similar. Better case in point is that of the standard model of particle physics, which I like better than the pregnancy. Because I was around since it has been started, actually, as I did my PhD in particle physics, so I actually followed the development. And it is a patchwork, and it is a bottom up approach, and it is very successful, but still it has you know, like 20 parameters, and, uh, and you know, the Lagrangian, if, when you write it, it's a one page, not a full page. 
and people are looking for more fundamental theories. Too. That's true. We are still not there, but uh, yeah, I, and, and just because these these modern theories like like Kevis and the Einstein agent theories, just because they're complicated, doesn't mean they're wrong. I mean, maybe just nature is just more complicated. GR is much more complicated yeah. than it is. That's right. It is. Yes. It is. We don't need the microphone, but uh, I have uh, uh, one uh, uh, as what uh, as a SLC and LC. I have a little suggestion. Whenever people ask questions, particularly in the first few days, if you could, people could speak their name first, so that we get to know uh, each other. I've also have been mom for many years. I recognize maybe only twenty percent of the faces, or even less of their voices. <laughs> if you people could kindly speak their name uh, at the question. And then I have a little question for my, myself. My name is Hong Shen Zhao. <laughs> and uh, so um, on this bottom, yes, uh, actually a very interesting point about the bottom up. And I was wondering how, how would people like Bettenstein or even further Einstein when they are faced with such complexity of data at their time. Okay, Einstein didn't have the fortune to to see all these data, um, which are available hundred years later. Um, what high principles he might draw on uh, to make to make uh, both gravitational wave physics and galaxy phenomena to speak together? Um, I realize and also that at. Uh, um, it's more like a comment as well. Uh, as uh, um, Milgram was saying, the standard model is allowed 20 so uh, parameters. Why is that? Milgram restricts himself to one parameter and has said that, that has to be fixed. In the standard, <laughs> in standard model, there is even a Higgs field which helps to give masses to things. Yes? And, uh, uh, there's a lot of freedom uh, in how that theory ex extends to uh, the supersymmetry or whatever. So why, what, what is the rationale except simplicity? Yeah, to introduce just one parameter, and also Einstein introduced ten, sorry, uh, uh, a four by four metric. Okay, instead of one potential, he introduced essentially ten potentials. To describe something so simple as things falling, okay, light wasn't light bending wasn't even discovered back then. He didn't need all that bells and whistles. But so I wonder if Einstein faced with the same thing, what we say, what is available out there, we can use. He would have to commit to some form of quote unquote particle out there, such as neutrinos. Yes, he might have to concede there. And he would not be too content that the neutrino wasn't understood before he goes around to say, this is all the matter, and this is all the gravity. Um, uh, I, would thought, I would thought some thoughts as to adding more parameters to mount, but giving it a dynamical origin, which links to other mysteries which you know already in particle physics we cannot get rid of, such as and the neutrino which is almost like a matrix in this room. Every few centimeters there's a neutrino there. Okay, it's a movie. Okay, there are even three flavors. They are, they are constantly changing. Why is that? We can safely ignore that, says Mong has nothing to do with it.
I'd say don't go to other parameters, uh, variable or variable parameters unless you're Hello, I'm uh, Javier Hernandez. I have a question similar to the points raised by Stacy and Hongqing. Um, when I started looking at, at the mod and, and being uh, fascinated by the good agreement in galactic rotation curves and so on, one thing that worries me or that, that, uh, that keeps me awake at night, let's say, is, <laughs> is, is that there is no uh, physical principle to understand the transition. You know, if you look at something like the, the difference between GR and Newtonian gravity, the transition is not something you put in by hand, but something that the theory itself yields. You know, uh, and uh, the transition between one regime and the other. So, so this new function is obviously uh, a, a sort of um, uh, first approach, and a sort of zero order approach, but it cannot be something fundamental. No, there, there, there must be something uh, more, uh, more, more fundamental in a physical sense behind it. I was wondering if, uh, if you knew, you know, if, if Jacob Beckenstein had any ideas as to what would drive this transition between the standard regime and the modified regime, or if you have any ideas on the subject. Well, I think Jacob, you know, as I said, he would have liked to enunciate great, great principles that would, that would derive that would give him but he worked with one he had. And he had the phenomenology, and I think he was very impressed with the phenomenology. And he, and he used the, the mechanism that he had to construct the theory, which was the, the best that he could do, best that anyone could do. And the last question. Uh, Keith Hart, your your comment that A naught is the border of C times H naught is certainly intriguing. Are we close to the point where we have data that would show us that A naught does or does not depend on redshift? Uh, I don't think so. Not dependent on data, anyway. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, that's interesting because it comes to the point where it's wrong. Your question is to do that. You want to? Okay, we'll wait for that. I was also discussing it. 